Hey everyone, hope you all are fine. In this video, I'm going to tell you about gastrointestinal embryology. And by starting, first I'm going to tell you about the embryonic folding that may include development of the gut tube and the development of the peritoneum. After that, I'm going to tell you about the foregut that starts from esophagus and end, uh, ends at the second part of the duodenum, duodenum where there is ampulla of pater that is actually the point of insertion of pancreatic duct and the common bile duct. After foregut, I'm going to tell you about the midgut that starts from the lower duodenum and ends at the proximal two-third of the transverse colon. Then hindgut that uh, starts from the distal one-third of the transverse colon and ends at the anal canal just above the pectinate line. In this video, I'm also going to tell you about the intraperitoneal structures and the retroperitoneal structures that may include the primary and the secondary structures and some important pathologies and their treatment. I'm also going to tell you about the mesenteries, the components and the uh, vascular supply of all the three parts of the gut. So starting with the embryonic folding, at the third week of development, a trilaminar disc develops that consists of ectoderm, mesoderm and endoderm. The ectoderm consists of a single layer of epithelial cells, then underneath is present the neural tube and also underneath that is present the notochord that develops into a nucleus pulposus inside the vertebral discs afterwards. Be uh, under the ectoderm there is present the mesoderm that is the, in a, that is the intra embryonic mesoderm and it is divided further into three parts. The paraxial mesoderm that is further uh, responsible for the formation of the dermatomes, sclerotomes and myotomes. The intermediate mesoderm that is responsible for the formation of the kidneys and the gonads and the lateral plate mesoderm that is further divided into splanchnic and somatic mesoderm. The one that is going upwards is the splanchnic mesoderm and the one that is going downwards is the somatic mesoderm. Then comes endoderm underneath the intraembryonic mesoderm. The endoderm is further uh, important, very important for the development of the epithelial lining of the GIT system, the accessory organs and the glands. Underneath the endoderm is present the yolk sac that is very important for the production of the RBCs in the growing embryo. Above the ectoderm there is a cavity and known as the amniotic sac. The yolk sac. It, it secretes a type of connective tissue uh, which is called the extra embryonic mesoderm and uh, now this extra embryonic mesoderm is going to surround the yolk sac. So the extra embryonic mesoderm is going to surround the yolk sac and also the amniotic sac. So this extra embryonic mesoderm is connected to the somatic mesoderm and this planktonic mesoderm and the, this is possible because there is a pre, there is a coelom present here the cavity present here so around it is present the chorionic cavity and the attachment of the chorionic cavity is also present by which the umbilical cord is going to be formed so the continuation of the splanchnic and the somatic mesoderm forms the splanchnoplerk that covers the amniotic sac and the somatoplerk that covers the yolk sac. Now this is the third week of development. So this is the starting phase. Then the embryo starts folding and it folds into two planes. One is the transverse plane and the other is the sagittal plane that I'm going to draw and show it to you guys. So when the embryo starts folding, it folds into the sagittal plane and the transverse plane. I'm going to explain the sagittal plane first. So uh, around the fourth week of development, the endoderm expands outwards and a cranial and the caudal end is formed. Afterwards, the cranial end will be responsible for the formation of the foregut, while the caudal end will be, formation, uh, will be forming the hindgut and in between will be the midgut. The midgut uh, is connected to the yolk sac or the um, via the vitelline duct. The vitelline duct is uh, obliterated at the sixth week that I'm going to discuss later on. So around the uh, endoderm is the mesoderm. So the mesoderm and outwards is present the ectoderm. The ectoderm is responsible for the formation of the skin, 
the CNS including the brain and spinal cord and the neural crest cells that are later on responsible for the formation of the ganglion cells that will be forming the mesenteric plexus and the submucosal plexus of the GIT tract. Above it will be present the amniotic sac while below it will be the yolk sac. So there are two membranes present, one in the foregut that is known as the oropharyngeal membrane that will later on perforate to form the oral cavity. While in the hindgut, there is a cloacal membrane that will perforate to form the urogenital tract and the anal canal opening. So, around the sixth week of development, the vitelline duct will be obliterated and a ligament is formed that connects the midgut to the anterior abdominal wall. So, there will be a connection. And if this vitelline duct does not obliterate, then Meckel's diverticulum is formed. Around the sixth week of development, the ileum and the jejunum uh, loops around the midgut will herniate from the umbilical ring. And this happens because all of the organs like liver and uh, uh, other organs of the abdominal cavity are growing in size. And uh, because of this, the space between the abdominal cavity is very reduced and it pushes the gut loops out of it. But when the time passes, the gut loops uh, are outside the abdominal cavity. The abdominal cavity grows in size as the fetus grows in size. The space is made again and these gut loops will be uh, transferred back and enter back into the abdominal cavity on about 10th week of development. And when they enter back to the uh, abdominal cavity, a counterclockwise uh, a counterclockwise rotation of 270 degrees will also occur at that time. If these contents do not enter back into the abdominal cavity, then a defect known as omphalocele will be occurring. Omphalocele that can be confirmed by the fetal ultrasonography and the maternal blood levels of alpha fetoprotein. Now we'll be discussing the transverse plane folding of the embryo. So when the embryo uh, folds into the transverse plane, the um, endoderm gets sucked in. It is like sucked in and it uh, folds downwards and outwards. And the amniotic sac also grows downwards and forms the two lateral folds that pinch on the um, vital, uh, vitalin duct. And uh, this uh, pinching obliterates the vitalin duct. And uh, if the, this does not uh, like obliterate and these two folds does not meet at the end, there is a space or cavity from which the actual gut loops can get out and a defect called as gastroschisis can occur. So this is the main difference between omphalocele and gastroschisis pathophysiology. Talking about the layers, it is same as what I told before, there is ectoderm. Above it will be the amniotic sac and below it will be the neural tube and the notochord and uh, um, on both sides will be the mesoderm, intraembryonic mesoderm containing the paraxial intermediate and the lateral plate mesoderm and uh, below it is the endoderm that is uh, connecting to the yolk sac via the vitalin duct. So after the whole procedure occurs and the folding occurs and the pinching and the form, uh, fusion of the lateral folds occur, and other uh, diagram I'm going to make here, I'm going to explain it further. So we can here appreciate the mesoderm, the intraembryonic one. So the uh, lateral plate mesoderm has two layers, one going upwards and the other going downwards. The one that is going downwards is the splanchnic mesoderm. So when I'm going to make another uh, diagram here, the yolk sac or the endoderm is going to be covered by the splanchnic mesoderm and the upper one is the somatic mesoderm that is covering the amniotic cavity and when the two lateral folds of the amniotic sac are going to merge, then it, the upper end or the outer end of the endoderm and the uh, sp splanchnic mesoderm are going to be covered by the somatic mesoderm. So coming down to the next uh, image, I can uh, we can really appreciate it. So the green one that is the endoderm, 
that is mainly responsible for the formation of the gut tube. Then outside it is the splanchnic mesoderm like I explained before and this is very important and it forms the gut walls. The, the submucosa, muscularis externa, lamina propria, visceral serosa or peritoneum, visceral peritoneum. Outside it is a space or cavity and outside that cavity is the somatic mesoderm like I explained before. And this is responsible for the peritoneal, uh, parietal serosa or parietal peritoneum. And uh, both of these, the visceral and the parietal peritoneum or serosas are connected by the mesentery. And uh, the space between is known as the peritoneal cavity. So the organs that are going to be placed inside the mesentery that are going to be uh, placed inside the uh, between the somatic, uh, the parietal serosa and the visceral serosa and are going to be attached by the mesentery are all going to be known as intraperitoneal organs while the ones staying outside uh, the uh, peritoneum the parietal and the visceral peritoneum and are not attached by the mesentery are going to be known as the retroperitoneal organs that can either be originally the retroperitoneal structures or uh, while growing or the development they are pushed outwards behind the peritoneum against the uh, posterior abdominal wall and few examples can be the kidneys, the adrenal glands, the uh, the uh, some part of the duodenum or ascending and descending colon. So the retroperitoneal organs include the primary retroperitoneal organs and the secondary retroperitoneal organs. The primary retroperitoneal organs are those that never had a mesentery and were never surrounded by the uh, parietal and the visceral peritoneum and the example can be AIA KUB. So uh, it's the aorta, the inferior vena cava, the kidneys, the ureter, the bladder, the adrenal glands and the lower part of the rectum. While the secondary retroperitoneal organs are those that once had uh, uh, the mesentery and the parietal and visceral peritoneum during development and then they were pushed backwards and then they lost their mesenteries. So these um, include the second, the third and fourth part of duodenum, the ascending and the descending colon, ascending and descending colon. The uh, head and body of pancreas. So the question arises that if these are not uh, um, having the they are they do not have the mesentery. So how are they going to attach? So they are attached by a fibrous connective tissue, the thick fibrous irregular connective tissue known as the adventitia, through which they are attached to the posterior abdominal wall. So after studying all this, we uh, can um, interpret that the ones that have the mesentery and the peritoneums, they are they have more mobility, and the ones that are attached to the uh, posterior abdominal wall uh, do not have that much of the mobility because of the uh, mobility because of the um, adventitia that is a thick connective tissue. Now, after explaining all this, I have explained the folding of the embryo, the formation of the gut and the uh, formation of the intraperitoneal and retroperitoneal organs and also some defects that can occur while the folding of the embryo. So, after this, I'm going to explain the uh, formation of specifically the foregut, midgut, hindgut, their vasculature, their contents and the mesentery, their mesenteries. So I'm going to tell you all about that in the next part. So I hope you all like this video. Please subscribe to my channel. Thank you so much for your time.